three, two, one. We have lift off. Vehicles pitching downrange. Good morning and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. As is always the case, I am going to be talking about matters that just about everybody else in the media has ignored when we're talking about a flight of Starship. But before I get started with any of this, I absolutely want to emphasize just how incredible this whole experience was, just watching it online, and I wish to hell I could have been there in person to witness this historic moment, a type of landing, a type of space flight different than anything that has ever been carried out in the past, and an engineering task that I seriously doubted. Although, if you listen to my narration as I was watching the whole thing, I was beginning to seriously wonder as to whether or not anything was beyond SpaceX's capabilities as this flight was taking place. So, I'm going to cover a number of details that maybe you haven't heard about because even though I would love to go on and on about how amazing the experience was, I'm not telling you anything different than any other commentator is going to be telling you at this point. And I think there's a number of other things about this flight that need to be shared, that need to be analyzed in order to determine the long-term viability of this program and its chance of succeeding in the amount of time that we have left before Artemis 3 takes place, and perhaps even more importantly, Elon Musk's proposed missions to Mars. Given the huge leap that was just taken yesterday, is getting to Mars in two years a possibility now? We're going to find out right now. All right, so I need to go ahead and give a couple of disclaimers before I get going on this because I'm going to make loads of people angry. I'm sure most of you think that I have nothing to complain about now given how impressive this entire test was, but before I share with you all of my analysis of the things, again, that I don't think the media is talking about, I want to share something with you about the Vulcan Centaur launch, as strange as that might sound. And let's talk a little bit about some of the headlines. ULA's Vulcan nail cert to orbit despite SRB nozzle issue. ULA Northrop address rocket booster failure during successful launch. Vulcan Centaur Cert 2 test flight makes robust escape after solid rocket booster nozzle blowout. Vulcan Centaur avoids FAA scrutiny after losing a solid rocket booster nozzle. The solid rocket booster nozzle was the only damn thing that the media was talking about with the Vulcan Centaur flight, even though it achieved the exact orbit that it was supposed to achieve, accomplished the mission without any problems whatsoever, and right now, Centaur 5 is orbiting the sun because of two successful secondary engine burns after the primary. Very, very impressive flight, and yet we have that nozzle blowout, which did have an impact, but certainly not on the overall disposition of the flight. It was designed well enough to not really be affected by that, and yet we have that in all the damn headlines. And yet, the elephant in the room is not being discussed at all by anybody in the media, including people who obviously hate Elon Musk. It's like they're not taking the time necessary to actually analyze what Starship is all about and what this flight actually means. So first of all, let's talk about the positive things. All of the engines, as you can see on the booster, on the orbiter, everything performed perfectly. Raptor is looking as bulletproof as you might imagine. Well, 
Raptor 2 anyway. It's going to take Raptor 3 and its improved performance in order to deliver the payloads that Starship is supposed to be delivering to orbit here. So we are going to see some changes to Raptor regardless in order to get Starship operating the way it's supposed to. But still, I have every confidence that SpaceX is going to be able to do that beautifully given how well these engines performed. That being said, I'm also pretty impressed with the performance of the BE-4 so far. Yeah, only four engines, but hell, at least they're working so far on both the flights of Vulcan Centaur, and that means good things for New Glenn. Positive number two, the heat shield definitely performs substantially better than it has on any other flight thus far. Now, that is probably attributable to the extra layer of ablative insulation that was included underneath the heat shield, so we have essentially a double heat shield protecting Starship at this point, but unfortunately, as we all saw, there still was some burn through on the flaps, and this, of course, could be problematic to at least the reusability factor on Starship, and we really didn't get an opportunity to see any of the evidence of how well the heat shield was protecting the rest of the ship. I would hope that the only thing, the only really Achilles heel with this heat shield are these joints between the flaps and the main fuselage of the rocket, but then again, we're not really going to know that until we actually get an opportunity to have a look at a Starship post-flight, which may not happen for a while. Although, perhaps, a camera internally might have been nice to see if there was any sort of burn through on the fuselage. We didn't get a chance to see any of that, even though I think SpaceX probably could have provided that information. But nevertheless, we're going to go with the assumption that the heat shield only has that Achilles heel right now, so there definitely is a road forward to fixing that. Now, I'm glad that we're looking at this part of the footage at this point, because this, in my opinion, was perhaps the most impressive part of the flight, aside from the catch maneuver, of course, and that is the precision of the re-entry. The projected re-entry corridor for Starship was absolutely enormous, hundreds of kilometers, and I very much doubt that SpaceX put cameras along the entire length of that corridor. Instead, they put cameras pretty much exactly where they thought the orbiter would set down, and indeed, it set down pretty much precisely where it was supposed to absolutely astonishing precision. The only other possibility I can think of as to how they managed to capture that footage is by jettisoning a camera set from the orbiter as it was beginning its landing burn, and that's how they got the footage. There are cameras that are designed to do that with lunar landings, but even if that's the case, that's pretty impressive as well. But overall, I would say that they almost certainly had a barge out there of some kind. But now, of course, we're looking at the most important part of the test, and that is the capture. And I'm sure it's going to disappoint all of you to hear that I don't have a lot of other things to say about it. So much has been said about this already. Astonishing accomplishment, amazing engineering. I didn't think they'd be able to do it on the first try or even the fourth try, and yet look what they managed to do. Very, very impressive indeed. But nobody is talking about the elephant in the room, and that is the fire, or perhaps fires, that were taking place during the landing. Something that I talked about extensively in previous episodes when discussing Flight 4. I've had a number of members of my team examine this fire in great detail, people who have a lot of experience with this sort of thing, and they say that it appears that we had a fire being created by the venting or something that followed the venting down to the manifold, and there a methane leak persisted and the fire continued, and it burned for several minutes after the capture was carried out. Now, incidentally, when I've seen this fire, mentioned and 
doesn't seem to get mentioned a whole lot. It's called a little fire. Let me tell you something. If you can see a fire on a booster this gigantic, it's not a little fire. A little fire would be practically invisible. This is a pretty gigantic fire. Even the smallest fire, especially down around the manifold, something that burns for several minutes, is something that puts the booster at risk and probably caused a substantial amount of damage to the propulsion system as well. And that's my entire point. As impressive as the capture was. Unless we can reuse the booster quickly and effectively, unless SpaceX is able to master that process, then the capture is little more than a novelty. The capture removes the need for landing legs, thus lowering the weight of the booster, which is very important because this rocket is way too heavy as it is, and of course it also has the advantage of not having to go through an actual physical landing, meaning that the booster will probably be in better shape than if it was using landing legs, but still, if the booster is coming in this hot and on fire and in this bad of shape, we're not going to be able to reuse it at all. And by the way, you can see from this photo that a lot of the nozzles were warped by all of the incredible heating. Elon Musk addressed that, said it can be easily rectified. Of course, he says that about every problem, and the heat shield, for example, was not completely rectified, improved, but not fixed in spite of all the extra time that SpaceX had to improve the heat shield because of the FAA delays. So, as far as reusability is concerned, and this is something that I mentioned with SN10, SN15 years ago, unless SpaceX can actually return a booster, an orbiter, any part of this ship that's in good enough shape to be reused, then this is not a mature system yet. This is nothing more than a gigantic, expendable, heavy lift rocket. Now, again, SpaceX accomplished pretty much everything they were setting out to accomplish with this test. But let's go ahead and compare this to another reusable system when it was mature. The Space Shuttle Columbia 1981, the maiden launch, could not have gone more beautifully, including a precision touchdown. And by the way, a lot of talk was made about this being the most impressive, spectacular spaceflight footage in history. Don't really see how you can compare that to the first touchdown of the Columbia Space Shuttle. It had human beings on board. It was a perfect re-entry. Heat shield held up okay. The fact of the matter is, Starship is just not at the level of maturity that Columbia was in 1981. It still has a ways to go. All of that having been said though, this was a massive leap forward. This is the leap forward that SpaceX definitely needed to have. The only thing that I think could be said about this launch that was less than ideal was the fire and the heat shield. And although I think SpaceX probably anticipated that the heat shield wasn't going to hold up perfectly, as a matter of fact, it was built into the FAA flight plan, the fire is a different story. I am still convinced that a similar fire was taking place at the end of Flight 4, and this was hidden from us. I really hope that I get some information information backed on my Freedom of Information Act request on all of that. But again, to re-emphasize, although I think this moment, well, at least in my recollection, when I was really worried about Columbia as a kid and watching this moment take place on television, although I think this was a little bit more momentous than what happened yesterday, what happened yesterday was probably the biggest event in spaceflight in the 21st century, and nobody can take that away from SpaceX, a tremendous engineering accomplishment and a tremendous leap forward. I am convinced that Starship will one day become an operational and groundbreaking, a transformational development in the history of spaceflight. But will it become completely reusable in two years? 
will SpaceX have mastered low Earth orbit refueling in two years? Will SpaceX be able to launch the 35 missions necessary to send two starships, or rather, I think five starships is what Elon said, out to Mars, plus the additional 22 launches necessary to carry out their Artemis 3 obligations? I still have significant doubts about that. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, at this moment, I'm about to head to the convention, the IAC convention in Milan. Can't wait to bring you all of the new developments, all of the new technologies in spaceflight. So please check the description for various ways to support this channel on Patreon and PayPal. And until next time, stay angry about space.